Look, no, we talked about it. no one's listening to doctors. No one's listening to the data. No one's listening to anything because we live in a world where you chase the rewards that you're being given. I don't blame the players. They can't say, hey, time out. I want to take control of my career. I'd like to throw 15 years. I'm going to do this. They'd say no. Five ball onto the track. At the wall. It's gone. Home run. Turns on a ball. Deep right field. And gone. What a game. What a moment. All right, and I'm happy to be joined again, as I am every single week, by the Hall of Famer, John Smoltz. And John, we are going to start with some golf questions. First up, the Masters just finished up. Scotty Scheffler winning once again his second Masters. He's on top of the world right now. First off, how much of the tournament did you watch, and what were your thoughts on this year's Masters? Yeah, I thought, you know, being obviously in Georgia, we experienced that weather. Uh, I got a chance to play two days while the Masters was going on just to see what 30 mile an hour winds was like. Um, (laughs) The world's greatest golfers on one of the most intriguing golf courses really met their match because of the weather. Uh, The weather is what got the scores down. And then, of course, you know, Scotty just doing what he does. it's, It's really fun to watch him with all the noise about what's going on with the other tour, you got the world's best just dominating and going about it in such a, I mean, obviously I love everything about him. Love his character. I love the way he goes about his game, but I thought the masters, I got a chance to watch it. Um, A lot of it on Sunday, I was driving here to Dallas to get ready for the tournament. So I got a chance. uh, Not that I was watching and driving, (laughs) but I was listening and driving. And obviously the last uh, six holes became kind of a runaway when it was really close with about six to go. So tell us where you are. You're in Texas for the Pro-Am. What, what's going on with this tournament? Yeah, so we've got the Invited uh, Celebrity Classic where we're playing with, alongside the Champions Tour uh, and their event. So celebrities get to mingle and play for their own purse along with the Champions Tour guys, which I've had a chance to play several events with. So they they're great. And, you know, the biggest thing is, I got to take down Tony Romo. He's the favorite. He's the defending champ. This is his backyard. So the competition is geared back up in the golf world for me. And then I resume my duties uh, back to baseball the following week with the Mets and the Braves. I was going to ask you if my guy uh, Marty Fish is there or not, but. Oh yeah. Marty, Marty's a defending champ as well. Uh, (laughs) I, uh, I tried to mess with him a little bit yesterday, um, but it didn't work. He's as cool as they come, and he's a great golfer. Well, if you run into him, he is a, a good friend. Please tell him I said hi and that I'm rooting for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, in the last few days, we've seen uh, we've seen some high tension in the Astros Rangers series, which seems to be a theme at this point. We saw it last year. We saw it in the ALCS. We saw benches clearing in Dodgers Padres series. So. I want to ask you at this current moment, not a historical question about rivalries, but at this current moment, who do you think is the best rivalry in the game of baseball? Well, um, you know, a lot has always been talked about the New York and Boston. I don't think you can make that claim right now. Uh, It's historically the best, no doubt. I think what's been churning and burning and what's been going on in the West Coast has been a desire for this to be. I mean, I think there's a a want to from the San Diego Padres. They made roster changes. They bolstered their roster. They were trying to take down their big brother, if you will. And the Dodgers just keep doing their thing. They kind of shrug it off. First, it was the Diamondbacks a while back. But you know what? Things have shifted, and the retribution, in a weird way, came to the Diamondbacks last year when they shocked everybody and knocked off the Dodgers – And I think it woke up not only the world to what can happen, but these rivalries that everybody wants is only as good as the two teams being good at the same time. And the Padres have been relevant. They got their chance. They knocked off, you know, the Dodgers a couple of years ago. So it really comes down to this 162 battle still comes down to who has the last say in the postseason. And it's going to come down to one of those two teams in the West that we mentioned, and really maybe those three, the Diamondbacks, the Dodgers, and the Padres. So 
Um, I'm going to go with the Dodgers and the Padres just because of location, just because of everything we talked about. Who was your, when you were playing with the Braves, who would you say was y'all's biggest rival? You know, we were in that weird division for a long time. We were in yeah. the West, so we were kind of the forgotten child till we, we shocked everybody in 91. I'd say the Mets and us when we really got going and, and we were on the downside and the Mets uh, ended up taking up uh, us all that streak. I believe they won. So I, it's kind of weird because Atlanta was in a neutral place for the longest time. Um, we shared a, a, a complex with the Expos forever, and that was kind of like the more irritant team we played because we had yeah. seen them a million times in spring training. But I would say the Mets overall, and that still kind of reigns today, even though the Braves have had a stronghold, you know, on the division over the last six years. Since speaking of the Braves, since we last talked, Spencer Strider officially undergoing Tommy John out for the season. We spoke at length last week about why pitchers are getting injured, what to do, all of that. That was a honestly a, a really fun conversation to have. But Spencer Strider now going to miss the year. So my question for you about the Braves is not are they still going to be good? I still believe they're very much so a playoff team. But can this Braves team, without Spencer Strider, win a World Series? Can they get to where they want to without their ace of a staff? Yeah, I would say it this way. They're vulnerable now. Um, they they were less vulnerable with a, an ace like Spencer Strider at the front of the rotation. Look, don't know how Chris Sale's going to hold up. That was a great signing, and that was a great signing knowing you had Spencer Strider to lean on and Max Freed to lean on, and then you complement Charlie Morton and Chris Sale. You got a formidable staff. Now it really puts the pressure again on their offense. Can their offense do what it did last year and then not go dormant? in the postseason when yep. they needed them the most. And it's a lot of pressure to ask, but I think they became very vulnerable, but yes, they're still very good. You know, it would be the same as if the Dodgers lost one of their marquee guys in the rotation. Are they going to still win the division? Probably, but it's really more about when you ask these teams to win 160, play 162 game schedule, their rosters can handle that. But what happens when they get to the end? Can they run the gamut? And that's really what some of these teams are going to have to face again when they get to that point. And it's kind of proven the the playoff recipe to win is having, you know, basically three studs that you can turn to in a yeah. rotation for, for any given, for a five game series, for a seven game series, and then rotate that over. And now this just bumps everybody up a game. It makes you rely more so on the Charlie Morton health for the course of a whole season, the Chris sale health for the whole course of the season. So I'm with you. I still think they're extremely talented. They can, it just, it does bump everybody up a little bit and just it takes your depth away for sure. Yeah. The playoff system that we got now, you know, with the amount of off days, you've, you nailed it. I mean, I've always said, this is kind of the simplistic formula of baseball, three hot hitters at any time. Doesn't have to be the same three in your lineup, three hot bullpen guys at any time. It doesn't have to be the same three and three hot pitchers, yep. starters. And you saw what Texas did. They didn't have a full staff, but they got two really hot pitchers that carried them. And they did it in the formula that you have to win without losing rest. And you keep going to those guys. But when you're pushed to the max and you're playing big series, you need depth. And we'll find out if those teams that we're talking about get that, get that at the end of the year. So Strider does go down with that UCL injury, did get Tommy John. He is out for the year. And it is it is something we talked, like I said, at length about last week is the the why this is happening. And and we've talked about it a couple of times, but last week it just felt even more pertinent to talk about. I, I do want to ask you now, we, we know the why. I, I think you and I are on the same page there yeah. in terms of it's just the way the pitchers are. It's the game has changed. The game has evolved and pitchers are throwing harder and there's no reason not for, for them to air it all out and throw 100 miles an hour. But what I would ask you today is more the how. How does MLB fix this problem? Maybe not even MLB. How does baseball fix this problem that we have of pitchers coming up, needing to throw a hundred miles an hour. The, all the incentives in the world say, throw a hundred, spin it as hard as you can. So, I, you know, there's a few different theories out there, a few different conversations, but in your mind, how do we go about over the next two, five, 10 years, changing this problem that we have in major league baseball of pitchers getting hurt and needing Tommy John? Well, it's an unbelievable Pandora's box, right? And so much like the game and the way that it was being played over the last seven to 10 years, the game time went from 
relatively short to impossibly long. Yeah. So what did baseball do? They bit the bu- bullet and they made some rule changes. This has been my philosophy forever. If something keeps going the wrong way and you're asking people intuitively to change their philosophy, they tell you to go pound sand yeah. <laughs> uh, because that's that's the nature of business, the nature of sports is if I've got something that I think works, I'm going to keep doing it until there's a rule change. So to answer that question, I think baseball has to look at everything they're looking at. They're looking at the data. They're looking at the how. And the only way to fix it right now is to come up with a rule change, either via rosters, limit pitchers. There's ways to do it in rule changes that make teams go, oh, okay, we can choose to keep doing it this way. Or we can look at the advantages that the rules now are allowing us to think differently. And I'm going to ask my pitchers to do things differently. That's how you have a philosophical change. Look, no, we talked about it. no one's listening to the doctors. No one's listening to the data. No one's listening to anything because we live in a world where you chase the rewards that you're being given. I don't blame the players. They can't say, hey, time out. I want to take control of my career. I'd like to throw 15 years. I'm going to do this. They'd say no. That's not what we're paying you to do. So to me, that's the easier fix that will take a little longer time to to navigate and change. Because here's my point. How did we get so smart, so strong, so technically advanced, but increase the rate of injuries at a level that's unsustainable? And that's the byproduct of everything that we just talked about. This is a trainable act. This is not rocket science. This game has been played for a long time. If you ask players to pitch eight innings again, they can learn it. (laughs) But you've got to water down. We become addicted to the outcome of statistical categories that define us. If a pitcher today has 3.5 strikeouts per nine innings, do you think he's going to pitch very long? There's no way. They're chasing the numbers that the uh, analytics and the the departments of baseball want them to chase. So if you don't have a 12.5 or 13.5 strikeout per nine inning, you're in a bad category. And so if we learn how to deal with a three point something ERA instead of two or one, and we learn how to dial back the things that we're used to, then you have a chance for change. Otherwise, when you see a pitcher that throws 89 miles an hour and is a pitcher, you look as look at him as more of a freak that survives a system that would never <laughs> inc- incorporate him again. Yeah, they're they're chasing numbers that they're told matter most. And I think that what needs to happen is there needs to be a shift in the number or the the value that that they bring. I believe it was Tyler Glass now the other day said throwing hard is worth the risk of injury. And that that tells you all you need to know right there. We need to find a way to make throwing hard not worth the risk of injury because there's incentives to throw seven, eight, nine innings in a game instead of five with 14 strikeouts or six with 14 strikeouts. But and I don't I don't blame him one. That's a very true statement that that needs to change somehow, though. And it is the game itself that and organizations and, and money that has that has determined all of that. But somehow there needs to be a way to make a shift in terms of what the value is on and, and what they're trying to accomplish. There's no doubt. And your brother was the model for the longest time on how to do things. And even now he's lived two generations of pitching. He started at 94 miles an hour in the first inning and ended at 99. He had that capacity. The, in my day and in the history of baseball, there's only a few Nolan Ryans, Bob Fellers. I would say if, if Nolan Ryan, when he played, there were 10 of him then you could look at that era and go, oh, now there's 20 of him, 25 of him. Like yeah. not literally the Nolan Ryan freak, but the guy that can throw pitches like Nolan Ryan. So to me, that is a, an easier answer to fix. When you're only looking for the Noah Syndergaards of the world and you're missing a lot of great pitchers, you've lost an entity of pitching that existed for a long time that's valuable that is no longer valuable in the game. John, always a lot of fun, my friend. Good luck in your tournament this week. Uh, we'll, we'll be rooting for you. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right, man. See ya. All right. Well, just wanted to thank John Smoltz for joining me as he does every single Saturday, no matter where he is, whether he's in Georgia, whether he had driven to Texas for a, 
a golf pro-am tournament. Uh, so always very appreciative of, of his time and willingness and want to do this every single week. It means a ton to me and hope you guys enjoy listening to him every single week because I do have fun with the conversations, especially this Tommy John pitcher injury conversation over the last couple of weeks because it is a problem in baseball. It is something that I think everybody wants to get fixed. It's just a matter of, of why it's happening, figuring out the why it's happening, and then figure out how to change it going forward. But uh, always appreciative of him. Thank you all for listening. Make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple or Spotify. And you can also watch on Spotify and on YouTube as well, Flippin' Bats Pod there. And make sure you follow us on TikTok. We are getting closer and closer to 100,000 followers and uh, go follow us and it'll help us out. But thank you all for listening. And remember, until next time, my friends, which will be Monday, find your bat and flip it.